call this class. If anyone's ready, go ahead. Hello, Professor. Nice. Yeah. Okay, so okay. I'm presenting 6.2. Okay. Uh, suppose that three balls are chosen without replacement from an urn consisting of five whites and eight red balls. Let xi equal one if the if ball selected is white and let it equal zero otherwise. Give the joint probability mass function of a, x1 and x2, and part B is x1, x2, and x3. So, so given from the question, we know that we have five white balls plus eight red balls, which give us 13 balls in total. And for part A, we, we want to find the joint probability mass function for x1 and x2. So since we have white balls and red balls, so we have the probabilities that we have to choose um, the white, only zero. So the white balls, we have zero, zero, probability of uh, not white balls, uh, red balls and white balls, and red balls and white balls, and one, one, which is white balls, white balls. So for the first one, we have probably zero, zero means red balls is eight times seven over 13 times 12, which give us that probably if only two red balls is 14 over 39. And the second one, probably that we have red and white balls, which is also equal to the probability that we have white and red balls is, is 40 over 156, which is also like the probability that 10 over 39. And the last one we have, probably that we have white balls, white balls one and one, five times four over 13 times 12 equals, we simplify this, five over 39 for probability. Mm -hmm. And then for part B, we want to find probably joint probability mass function for X1, X2, and X3, which means we have to choose three, three balls. So we have probably that choosing 0, 0, 0, probably 0, 0, 1, probably 0, 1, 0, probably 1, 0, 0, probability 1, 0, 1, probability 1, 1, 0, probability 0, 1, 1, and probability 1, 1, 1. So we, so 0, 0, 0, that is three red balls, eight times seven times six, divided by 13 times 12 times 11, which gives us probably 28 over 143. And probably having um, red balls, red balls, and white balls is also equal to probably 0, 1, 0 equals to probably 1, 0, 0, which gives us the probability is 70 over 429. And the probability of having, so we have white balls, white balls and red balls and white balls, probably one zero one equals, is also equal to probably that one one zero equals to probably zero one one, which give us the probability is 40 over 143. And lastly, we have probably one 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 which is all three white balls, five times four times three over 13 times 12 times 11, which give us the probability five over 143. Great, great, thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Um, yes, Tom. Yep. 
Okay. Okay. Six point seven. Consider a sequence of independent Bernoulli trials, each with a success probability p. Let x1 be the number of failures preceding the first success, and let x2 be the number of failures between the first two successes. Find the joint mass function of x1 and x2. So the joint mass function is um, multiplying the probabilities of the first um, n failures. So that's 1 minus p to the n power times probability of the m failures um, between the second success. That's 1 minus p to the m times p. And that's pretty much it. Um, <laughs> and m are you know, whole numbers. And zero otherwise. And I guess you could test this out with like a coin toss problem. Um, if you had like 10 tails first, then heads and then 20 tails and then heads this would be the joint mass function great great simple and nice yes thank you benoni trials next one can i go next is that okay oh. Yes, thank you. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Um, let me see. Um, can you come back to me? Sorry, I'm going to figure out how to do it. Oh, uh, OK. OK, who else like to present now? Nice. Um, Okay. This is 6.3. It follows Catherine's problem of 6.2. Okay. Um, in problem 6.2, suppose that the white balls are numbered and let y i equal 1 if the if for all i white balls is selected and 0 otherwise. Find the joint probability mass function of a y1 and y2. So the joint probability mass function of when um, y1 is 0 and y2 is 0 is 11 times 10 times 9 divided by 13 times 12 times 11, which you get 15 over 26. And then the joint probability mass function of uh, 0, 1, which is also 1, 0, they equal um, 5 over 26. And then for the joint probability mass function when y1 is 1 and y2 is 1 is 1 third times 1 twelfth times 1 times 3 times 2, which is 1 over 26. And then for part B, we're asked to find the joint probability mass, mass function of y1, y2, and y3. So when y1 is 0, y2 is 0, y3 is 0, we get 10 times 9 times 8 divided by 13 times 12 times 11, which gives us 60 over 143. And then um, when y1 is 0, y2 is 1, y3 is 0, you get 1 over third times 10 times 9 divided by 12 times 11 times 3, um, which is 45 divided by 286. And that is the same for when y1 is 0, y2 is 0, and y3 is 1, as well as when y1 is 1, y2 is 0, and y3 is 0. And then the um, joint probability mass function when 
y1 is 0, y2 is 1, y3 is 1, is 1 over 13 times 1 over 12 times 10 over 11 times 3 times 2, which gives us 5 divided by 143. That gives us the same answer for when y1 is 1, y2 is 1, y3 is 0, as well as y1 is 1, y2 is 0, and y3 is 1. And then finally, for the joint probability mass function of um, when y1 is 1, y2 is 1, y3 is 1, you get 1 over 3rd times 1 over 12 times 1 over 11 times 3 times 2 times 1, which is 1 over 286. Great. Yeah, that's why I can't, right, that's why I can't write them together because uh, yeah. the... Right, because each variable is uh, like an equally weighted. So I drew so, the the color yeah. arrows. Yeah. Yes, great. And that's Thank why you. it doesn't care about the distribute the what your permutation. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you, Yunxin. Thank you. Hi, Professor Luton. Hello. Yes. Mm. Oh. Uh, my question is 6.4, uh, which is uh, linked with the uh, Catherine question. It's gone. It popped up, Kara. It popped up, but now it's gone. Oh. It was okay. up. <laughs> okay, please. Can you see my screen, please? Oh, yes. Yes, now. My question is 6.4, which is attached with the uh, Catherine question. Uh, in which I have to find that repeat, uh, when the ball selected is replaced in the urn before the next selection. So I have to find in this uh, question, which is that suppose that three balls are chosen with the replacement from an urn consisting of five white and eight red balls. When the selected ball is replaced in the urn before the next selection, let xi is equal to one if the um, eighth ball selected is white, zero otherwise. Total number of balls are 13. The probability of selecting a white ball is equal to probability x is equal to 1, uh, 5 over 13. And the probability of selecting a red ball, which is equal to probability x is equal to 0, 8 over 13. x1, x2 can take the following possible pairs as um, <coughs> following pairs are as 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. The joint probability mass function of x1, x2. Uh, probability uh, 0, 0, which is equal to 8 over 13, multiply 8 over 13 because we are replacing <laughs> the ball, <laughs> we are replacing uh, in the urn before the next selection. So that's why we are here 8 over 13, multiply 8 over 13, which is equal to 64 over 169. Probability 0, 1, 8 over 13, multiply 5 over 13 is equal to 40 over 169. And probability 1, 0, it, it will end. Uh, uh, same with the previous probability and the probability 1 1 is equal to 5 over 13 uh, multiply 5 over 13 which is equal to 25 over 169 for the part b find the joint probability mass function of x1 x2 and x3 possible values 0 0 0 0 0 1 0 1 0 0 1 1 1 0 1 0 1 1 0 and uh, all x are 1 Probability 0, 0, 0, and here we will uh, put the probability of a white ball 8 over 13 and 8, well, multiply 8 over 13, multiply 8 over 13, which is equal to 512, um, 512 over uh, 2197. Um, then we will find the probability of 0, 0, 1, and here uh, 0 are for the white ball probability and 1 is for the red ball. So 8 over 13, multiply 8 over 13, multiply 5 over 13, which is equal to 320 over 2197. And similarly, we will find for the all combinations, we will find the probability for the all combination, which is uh, shown in, on the above. And then we will get the answers, which is Great. written in front. Yeah. Yes, Professor. Great. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. That's beautiful. I figured out how to share if I can go now. Great. Great. All right, so mine's a little long, but the severity of a certain cancer is designated by one of the following grades, one, two, three, four, with one being the least severe and four the most severe. If X is the score of an initially diagnosed patient and Y is the score of that patient after three months of treatment, 
Hospital data indicates that P i j equals the probability of x equals to i and y equals to j is given by the following. So I thought this was like a good sum up of what we've been talking about. Like the probability mass function was the first part, then the expected value and variance. So I made this little chart. Um, I wrote like a little example. So when x is 1, I just went to everywhere where x was 1. So in the yellow, and then I put that, I added them together, which got me 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, and 0 0.2. And then I did the same exact thing for the y's, so like the green little dots. Everywhere was 1, 2, 3, 4, I added those together, which got me 0 0.18, 0 0.3, 0 0.31, and 0.21. So that was part A. And then part B, to find the expected value, I multiplied the number that was in the top of my chart by the bottom. I did that for both of the cases. So I got 2.5 and 2.55, which is talking about, you know, if the score of the initially diagnosed patient and then after three months. So then for the, ex for the variance, sorry, I took the number that was in the top of my chart and I raised it to the second power because we have x to the second, and then that got me 7.3, and I did the same for y. So I did 1 to the second power times the numbers from above, and I got 7.53. Then for the variance, I did, I used these numbers, and I plugged it in. So from before, we have 7.3, and then I subtracted the 2.50 from the expected value and raised it to the second power. So I combined the two numbers, which was helpful for me, and then I did the same for variance. So I got that the variance of x, so that the variance of the initial diagnosis is 1.05, which is very close to the variance for the three months later for the patient. Very interesting. Huh? The numbers are very close. Yeah, I was surprised also, but I think it also mm -hmm. makes sense because it's only one to four, and I'm hoping that a lot of people are less severe than severe. <laughs> right? <Okay. laughs> Thank you very much, Emma. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Hold on a second. I'm trying to give grace. So I won't forget. Yes. So 6.5, repeat problem, 6.38, and the ball is the lead. It's replaced in the on um, before the next selection. So the only difference is uh, replaced. So instead for, for the from, from the 6.38, instead of 13 times 12 times 11, you have 13 times 13 times 13 for the denominator for all those. And then we have four case. Uh, we have the, the, the white one denotes the white ball with number one and white two be the white ball with number two. And when when y one when y one equal to one, that means number one is select equal to zero means not select. Similarly for the y two, so for the for y equal y one equal to zero and y two equal to zero, we have eleven times eleven times eleven over thirteen cube, because. Uh, because y1 and y2 is not select and, and the probability when y1 and y2 is not select would be 11 over 13. That's for the 0, 0. And for the 1, 0, we have number 1 is select. So we have 1 over 13 and then 11 square over 13 square. That's when single 1 is select. And this would be double one, triple one. And similarly, the single two, double two, triple two. And for the fourth case, when number one and number two are select, we have um, two case. The first one represents the uh, number one is select, this one, the second row represents the number two is select. And this one would be the ball other than one and two. That would be 11 outcome. And also we have outcome. And we also have case when the third row 
is repeat either one or two. But in this case, we got to divide by two factor real. Because when those two, when two out of three are the same, we can just group them and then we got to divide by two factor real. And mm -hmm. that's the outcome, I mean, result. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. Sure, as let me make a presenter. Ayat, uh, yes. Okay, who's next? I got question 6.8. The okay. joint probability density function of X and Y is given by the following. A, find C. B, find the marginal density of X and Y. C, find the, this one. And then for A, you just uh, plug in the, plug the function into integrals, solve and solve for C by steps. And then you get C, it's four over three. And for B, finding the marginal density of X, what you do is like uh, finding an x by dy, then you evaluate to get 4 over 3 parentheses x plus 1 4. It's a range in between zeros and 1. And then you do the same thing for uh, marginal density for uh, y. This time you do for the dx, then you solve it for to get four over three parentheses with half plus y to a third power between zero and one. And then for the x, for this one, you do <coughs> you expected value. expectation of x and y. You do the integrals of, you plug in the, uh, Evaluate the integrals from one to zero of dx and dy, and then solve it to get the expectation of x and y to be 16 over 45. Okay, yeah, this is similar to one of the examples. Very nice. Yeah. Cool. Can you see my screen? Yes. So I'm going to present 6.1. A coin is toasted three times. Find the joint probability mass function of x and y when a x is the number of heads in all three tosses and y is the number of tails. So we know that the total possible outcome, which is <clears throat> 2q, is equal to a. And I use H to represent the heads and T to represent the tails. So these are A outcomes we will have. And by the question, we know that X is the number of heads in the three times and Y is the number of tails. So in here, X and Y can both take 0, 1, 2, or 3. So the joint um, probability mass function which is when x equal to zero, y equal to three, we will have one outcome. So the probability of zero, three, which is one over a, and x equal to zero, y equal to two, we will have three outcomes. So the probability of one, two, which is three over a, and x equal to two, y equal to one, 
we also have, will have three outcomes. So the probability of two, one, which is three over eight, and x equal to three, y equal to zero, which will have one outcome. So the probability of three, zero, which is one over eight. And also I make a diagram to see that um, beside um, this four probability, others all are zero. And B, X is the number of heads on the first two tosses, and Y is the number of heads on all three tosses. So X in here can take zero, one, or two, and Y in here can take zero, one, two, or three. So the joint probability mass function, which is when x equal to zero, y equal to zero, which is um, we have one outcome, which is t t t. So the probability of zero zero, which is one over a, and x equal to zero, y equal to one, one, and we will have one outcome, which is t t h. So the probability of zero one, which is one over a, and x equal to one, y equal to one, we will have two outcome, which is h t t t h t. So the probability of one one, which is two over a, and x equal to one, y equal to two, also have two outcome, which is h t h t h h. So the probability of one two which is two over a, and x equal to two, y equal to two. We only have one outcome, which is h, h, t. So the probability of two, two is equal to one over a, and x equal to two, y equal to three. We will have one outcome is h, h, h. So the probability of two, two, three, which is equal to one over a. So also make a, I also make a diagram that besides these six um, probability, either or are zero. And C, X is the absolute difference between the number of tests and the, the number of tails in all three tests, and Y is the number of tails. So X in here can take zero, one, or three. There's no two because we didn't have the difference between heads and tails have two. So like the first one, the difference is three. And the second one is two minus one, so it's one. This is also one, 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 one. And the last, last one is three. So they didn't have two. So, and y also can take zero, one, two, or three. So the join the probability mass function, which is when x equal to three, y equal to one. We have one outcome, so the probability of three, zero is one over a. And x equal to three, y equal to three, also one outcome. So the probability of three, three, which is one over a. And x equal to one, y equal to one. So we will have three outcomes. So the probability of one, one, which is three over a, and x equal to one, y equal to two, we also will have three outcomes. So the probability of one, two is three over a. And we finger that um, besides this four probability, other or are zero. Great. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you, show you. Thank you. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so I'm presenting question 6.11. And it asks, in example 1D, verify that f of xy equal to 2e to the power of negative x times e to the power of negative 2y is indeed a joint uh, density function. So in order to do that, um, we have to validate the joint density function by checking that the integral must be equal to 1. 
And because the exponential function is non-negative, we also know that the joint distribution function is either um, equal to or greater than zero. So we set up the integral uh, equal to the bounds that they gave us from zero to infinity for both x and y. And I first integrated for y, uh, and we know that the integrating e is equal to itself over the coefficient of its exponent. And then I plug in the bounds, and I reach uh, half times the integral of our x values. And we know that, obviously, 2 times half would cancel out. So it brings us back to the integral of just e to the power of negative x. And when we further, further integrate that, that will leave us with negative 1 over 1, which is the same thing as 1. So it is a joint density. Yes. Nice. Nice. Thank you. Okay, I'm next. Give me a second. Okay. Uh, Windows. Yeah, I did go. <laughs> okay, so the question is 523. Uh, a card is picked uh, at random from a shuffled card deck of four 500 consecutive uh, times. Uh, question A, what is the approximate probability that a red card will be picked between 250 and uh, 300 times inclusively? Okay, uh, we can uh, present uh, this uh, issue as a binomial distribution uh, with a number of trials 500 and the PR's probability of picking a red card, which is equal to uh, 0 0.5 because half of the deck is red color. Um, and the probability of uh, picking an even, uh, the card with the even number is equal to uh, 20 over 52, which is 5 over 13. Uh, because uh, in four suits, there are uh, five uh, cards for the even number. Okay, this is the formula for binomial uh, variable. Uh, in uh, part A, is calculated uh, by uh, using these numbers. Um, I used uh, RStudio to calculate uh, the presentation. Um, which is equal uh, in part A is equal to 50 almost 52 uh, percent. And uh, this uh, uh, sum of probabilities from 250 to 300 successful uh, picking um, of red card. Uh, so uh, it's from the middle to the 300. That's a part of the graph. Okay, um, looks nice. And uh, yeah, that's uh, called in R Studio. That's called in Python. Um, okay, part B, uh, where probability is uh, five over thirteen. I also used uh, R Studio. I um, subtract. Um, probability uh, from choosing 0 to 200 uh, from the total probability, which is 1. That's why it equal to 23%. Yeah, that's a graph for part B. So that's a percent, uh, the area to the right from uh, the red line. Let's see here. Okay, Catherine has some questions. Catherine, probably you are feeling weird. This looks like a normal distribution, right? Yeah, this is normal distribution. Uh, in the first graph, uh, because of probability is 0 0.5, uh, the peak is in the middle from 0 to 500. And the second, second graph, um, because the probability is lower than 0 0.5. That's why the peak is uh, moved to the left. So later on, we're going to talk about, like, Catherine, you're feeling weird, I know. Uh, later on, in chapter 8 or 7, 
there's something called the limit theorem. Okay, limit theorem will explain this one. Um, but it's nice, I uh, thank you. But you're still in chapter five. We're in chapter six already. <laughs> okay. I, yeah, I prepared for this like three weeks, three weeks ago. I just did have a chance. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the online class, it's good. Right? We can do multi-task test testing. It's, it's great. I like online class. I like this class. It's good. I think um, you guys are doing fantastically. Okay, that's Ayad. Who's next? But not everybody, though. Some of you need to catch up. If you want to pass this course, you really have to catch up. So our final will be on campus, right? And I don't have a date and time yet. As soon as I get it, I'll post it on Blackboard. So let's see, everyone, go oh yeah. Everyone has gone, right? Yes, I think I have everybody. Okay, now it's my turn. Let's see what's, Okay, let's see. Mm -hmm. So we did talk about the joint distribution functions. Six point two. Sorry if I do too fast. Right, if you have missed the previous class, uh, we're in chapter six now. We're in chapter six now, and the last class we did talk about the joint distribution function, and which uh, some of them showed us the examples of it, which is very nice. Joint distribution function basically means we can, you know, we have probability distribution, and the variable, the 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 the, the variables are equally weighted, all right. And then we can consider them at the same time. Uh, so now six, we're going to 6.2, talk about independent random variable. Okay, here. I'm going to read again. Random variables x and y, and of course, right? We we mentioned in the last class. These can be the variables can be finite many. We have seen from the presentation we seen have two variables or three variables. So basically means we can have a finite many. The random variables x and y are said to be independent if for any two sets of real numbers a and b, you know, x in a, y in b. And the probability of these two with comma is a little bit different from before, right? Before we talk about two events. This looks like a two events, the intersection of two events. X in A, Y in B, the probability is the multiplication of those two probabilities. So this is for these two independent, right? Two independent. In other words, X and Y are independent if for all A and B, the events, event A, right, for the random variable in A set, and the B are independent. 
So it can be show, shown by using the three axioms, the probability of equation will follow if and only if, both directions, if and only if. For all A and B, the probability of uh, X less than or equal to A, Y less than or equal to B, right? That's basically, you can think that's F of, okay, anyway, let me not make this confusion. Just equals to this. Because we are doing continuous random variables, right? That's how we calculate the probability. Probability of X less than or equal to A is accumulative. We used to, we, we usually we use the capital letter F of A to represent. So it's just mother, if those two are independent, just multiply the probabilities of these two. So hence, in terms of a joint distribution function F of X and Y, X and Y are independent if, right, exactly. That's the, that's the notation we are familiar with, right? F of A comma B is F, the full node X of A and F full node with Y of B for all A and B. When X and Y are discrete random variables, the condition of independence is equal to this. The equivalence follows because you know, it's satisfied. And the way of obtaining equation by letting A and B respectively, the one point sets. So this is a little proof of that. Yeah. Because they're independent. So the key is from this step to this step. Because they're independent, so we can split the two summation signs. <clears throat> so if in the joint continuous case, so that's for discrete in continuous case, the condition of independence is equivalent to the density function presentation. Right. So basically, well, we have different kinds of presentations. So loosely speaking, X and Y are independent if knowing the value of one does not change the distribution of the other. Right? They, have no, they have no effect on each other. Random variables that are not independent are said to be dependent. Let's see this example. Suppose N plus M independent trials having a common probability of success P are performed. If X, is a, if X is the number of successes in the first N trials and the Y is the number of successes in the final M trials, then X and Y are independent. Since knowing the number of successes in the first N trials does not affect the distribution of the number of successes in the final M trials. <clears throat> in fact, for integral X and the Y, probability of x equals a little x, y equals a little y, would be out of n choose x probability of success, that x successes, and n minus x failures for the first n, for the first n trials, for the second, for the m trials, where m choose y, y successes, and m minus y failures, and x goes from 0 to n, y goes from 0 to m. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's this. That's the probability of x multiplied by probability of y. Right. In contrast, x and z will be dependent, where z is the total number of successes in the n plus M trials, right, right. So that's the first one, first example. 
Second one, suppose that the number of people who enter a post office on a given day is a Poisson random variable with a parameter lambda. Show that if each person who enters the post office is a male with probability P and a female with probability of one minus P, then the number of males and the females entering the post office are independent Poisson random variables with the respect parameter lambda P and the lambda times one minus P. So we want to show this, right? We want to show if each person into the, if the probability for male P and the female one minus P, then, then the number of males and females, the Poisson random variable with the parameter of number P, this is for uh, males, and the number one minus p for female. So let x, y denote the number of males and females. And we shall show the independence of x and y by establish, by, you know, to show the equation holds. So to obtain the expression for p of x equals i, y equals j, we, con we condition on whether or not x plus y equals i plus j. So this gives, so probability of x equals to i, y equals to j is probability of, let's see this. Given the condition, so x plus y does equal to i plus j, then the probability of this plus a multiply so we have two parts. We have probability of this, this one. This is a condition with a condition, right? Well, x plus y is indeed i plus j. And multiply by the probability of x, y equals i plus j. Remember, this is uh, before what we have. We have a conditional probability. We have this conditional probability equals to probability of this divided by probability of this, right? So now we can write this way. We can write the numerator equals to <clears throat> equals to the other side multiplied by the denominator <clears throat> plus this part. Well, this is i equals to j. What if I am not equal to j? So this part is x plus y does not equal to i plus j. So they divided into two groups to consider. So be careful, this is not a probability of e, this one plus this one. No, it's, it is, right? It's merely a way. So, now, since this one is clearly zero, right, because x plus y, because y, because those two are independent, right? If it's not independent, we cannot make this conclusion. But because male and the female, we don't consider the, the middle gender, right? So either male or female, so we presume this. Uh, so it's zero, so we, we get this. We get this. So the second part, then x plus y now equal to x, i plus j part is just zero. So get this one. Now, because x plus y is the total number of people who enter the office, so we have probability of x plus y equals to i plus j as this one, right, equals to probability of this, which is a Poisson distribution, right? We're given this Poisson distribution. So we have e to the negative lambda, lambda raised by i plus j, divided by i plus j factorial.
Furthermore, given that the I plus J people do enter the post office, since so each person entering will be male with probability of P, it follows that probability that exactly I of them will be male and the J of them will be female. It's just the binomial probability, right? which is out of I plus J of them choose I and uh, uh, male I of them, female J of them. So then what do we have? So we have probability of this. This is a conditional part. I plus J, all the I plus J choose I, we have this. And if we substitute this into the previous one, we get a probability of I, J equals, the, equals this, this part. This part, the conditional part, multiplied by the Poisson, the Poisson part. And maybe we can simplify a little bit. Once we simplify, let's see how does this simplify. This is e to the lambda. We still have the e to the lambda here. We have lambda p. Oh, okay. <clears throat> you see this. P raised by I, lambda raised by I. So we can put these two together, lambda P raised by I. Then we have lambda, one minus P raised by J, because one minus P raised by J, and lambda raised by J. We can put those two together, lambda, one minus P raised by J. <coughs> Excuse me. And if we simplify this one, so this is the I plus J factorial divided by I factorial divided by J factorial. So that simplifies I plus J factorial divided by this I plus J factorial. This is gone. So I left with I factorial, J factorial in the denominator. Now, if we rewrite this, right? If we rewrite this, we see this part is just a person for number P, for the parameter of number P. And this part is just the Poisson for parameter lambda one minus p, right? So bingo, <clears throat> we have a p of i is this part, and a p of y is this part, right? So. Right. So that's a proof. Very nice proof, isn't it? Anyone has any questions? This looks like a homework question. In the end, this is mathematics. Okay, let's see the next example. A man and woman decide to meet at a certain location if each of them independently arrives at a time uniformly distributed between 12 noon and 1 p.m. Find the probability that the first to arrive has to wait longer than 10 minutes. All right, uniform distribution. So we let X and Y denote the time past 12 that the man and the woman arrive. The, so men arrive X, women arrive Y. And those are independent variables, each of which is uniformly distributed over the 60 minutes between 12 noon and 1 p.m. The desired probability of, so we want to find probably the first arrive uh, to wait for, or, right, has to wait longer than 10 minutes. So it means, so probability of Either a woman with longer 10 minutes than the man, or a man with longer 10 minutes than, no, the opposite, right? the opposite way. So which by symmetry equals to two times P of X plus 10 less than Y, or the other way around, or two times P of Y plus 10 less than X, so then we get this. So let's see what do we get. We want to we want to integrate over this, right, for the density function. 
And the density function is a uniform, uniform over 60 minutes, so the one over 60. And for women, it's one over 60. For men, it's one over 60, so that's one over 60 square. And because it's independent, we have this joint independent function. Because it's independent, so f of x comma y equals the f of f of x, f x of x times f y of y. So we should, for either one is the one over sixty uniform distribution. So that's a square. Then let's see what is this. So we have draw this line. <clears throat> so we have x plus ten equals y. We draw the line. Then it's because wait longer than ten minutes. So it's from for one of the variables goes from ten to sixty. Right. Then the second variable just form just follow this line. Uh, you draw this line, so that's from zero, y minus 10. So this is x less than y minus 10. So the less than, that's why it goes from zero to y minus 10. So we just integrate. Integrate in the end, you get 25 over 36. Also very nice, nice question. Anyone has any question for this? Nice example. Okay, let's see next example. Next example is saying our next example presents the oldest problem dealing with geometric geometrical pro probability. It was first considered and solved by Buffon, a French neutralist of the 18th century, and it is usually referred to Buffon's needle problem. Let's see this one. A table is ruled with equal distance parallel lines, a distance d apart. A needle of length L, well, L is less than or equal to the parallel lines, the distance between parallel lines is randomly, randomly thrown on the table. What is the probability that the needle will intersect one of the lines? Well, otherwise, it only okay, only landed, only intersected with one of the lines instead of two of the lines. It's easy to think landed on two of the lines, right? Because it's less than the less than or equal to the distance of two lines. Interesting. Okay, let's see how do we do this. Let us determine the position of the needle by specifying one the distance of x from the middle point of the needle to the nearest parallel line. Two, the angle theta between the needle and the project line of the length x. The needle will intersect a line if the hypotenuse of the right angle, the hypotenuse, uh, hypotenuse, if the hypotenuse of the right triangle in this figure is less than half of L, that is, let's see this. So this is two lines. The distance is d. And if the needle only lands on one of it, so we can consider this situation, draw this triangle, consider the, the needle from this, form the angle with this. And this we call x. So this is saying x over cosine theta less than L over two. What is this? Because cosine theta. So if this from this one to this one is less than L over two. Right, if you can see my cursor. Cosine theta. The hypotenuse. So this hypotenuse is less than. The hypotenuse of this one is less than L over two. Because the cosine theta equals to uh, x times this hypotenuse. But if it's less than L over 2, so we can form this, by right? x over cosine theta less than L over 2. Or x is less than L over 2 cosine theta. Smart. 
as x varies between 0 and d over 2, and theta between 0 and pi over 2, it is reasonable to assume that they are independent. Hmm. 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 Yeah, you would think theta and x are dependent, right? Because within one triangle. So here says, so x varies between 0 and d over 2. Theta varies between 0 and pi over 2. So it's reasonable to assume that they're independent. OK, uniformly distributed random variable over these respective ranges. So we have probability of that case is just find x less than <clears throat> L over 2 cosine of the theta. And uh, oh, OK, they don't use data here. They use a y, right? Because data is a variable. So they change this y to be another. So basically, remember we used to use f y, uh, capital letter y, right, to represent. So here is just data. So use y to represent the value for data. And this change to be, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so consider this one. Consider this in the rectangle, right? in this rectangle, this lesson. So four over pi d, d is the distance between the two lines. And uh, theta goes from zero to pi over two, yes. And uh, the x value goes from half of L cosine y, yes. Okay, then to calculate this, in the end, we get 2L over pi D. Uh -huh. Okay, you do a little calculation about this. Okay, how did it get a 4 over pi D? Uh, let's see next example. The first two examples are better. OK, let's see. This is regarding normal distribution. That x and y denote the horizontal and vertical miss dist distances when a bullet is fired at a target. And assume that x and y are independent continuous random variables having differentiable density functions. The joint density f of x, y is because they are independent. Uh, uh, x, y, only through x squared plus y squared, because target is round. So loosely put, assume two states that the probability of a bullet landing on any point of the x, y plane depends only on the distance of the point from target and not on its angle of orientation. The equivalent way of phrasing this assumption is to see that the joint density function is a, Rotation invariant. It is a rather interesting fact that assumption one and two imply that x and y are normally distributed random variables. To prove this, we have first we have a density function equals to independent. So equals to for some function takes x squared plus y squared as input. So differentiating this one. So with, with respect to x, so we have this. Dividing those two, so we get this. Then we multiply 2x on both sides. So we, we divide 2x on both sides, so we get this. Because of left-hand side depends only on x, Hence, the value of the right-hand side depends on x squared, y squared. It follows that, okay, 
<clears throat> so this doesn't prove its point. <clears throat> it follows that the left hand side must be the same for all x. To see this, consider any x1, y, x2, and the y1, y2 be such that then we we would have this. Right. So that so this means the left hand side has to be some constant. And uh, or take a derivative of log uh, equal to cx, which implies upon integration of both sides, we have this. Since it's a probability distribution, it follows that so this is just a proof x is a normal random variable, all right. Remember the density function for normal random variable? So with a parameter of mu equals zero and sigma squared. All right, that's, that's too much for us. Let's see this proposition. The continuous discrete random variable, the continuous or discrete random variable x and y are independent if and only if that join probability density or mass function can be expressed as f x comma y x y equals to the product of those two. Um, yeah, this follows from the previous previous follows from the previous definition. Yeah. So this is a little proof. If we want to go through, let's see this one. If the joint density function of x and y is this. Uh, for both x and y positive, zero otherwise. Are the random variables independent? Mm, we can calculate. What if the joint density function is this? And x and y in the square. And x plus y also falls in the square. So, and is it equal to zero otherwise? Let's see. So for the first one, this one, second one is this one. For the first one, the joint density function factors and thus random variable are independent. In the second distance, oh, okay, we don't really have to calculate. This is saying, um, right, so the e to the negative two x, e to the negative three y, we just have two parts of this. Well, this can be e to the negative 2x minus 3y. All right, that makes sense. So one with exponential with v2 and the other with v3. Uh, in, the second example, in the second part, because region in which the joint density is non-zero cannot be expressed in the form x in a, y in b, the joint density does not factor, so the random variable are not independent. So if we can do this, let's see. So the density function can be represented as 20xy times, so this, which clearly does not factor into a party depending only on x and another depending only on y. That is true. All right. The concept of independence may, of course, be defined for finite many random variables in general. So we could have this, right? We could have this product of n probabilities. So it's a condition is equivalent to this, right? So this is just a notation for product, all right? Like a summation sign for sigma. So this is product. So finally, we see that a finite collection of random variable is independent if every finite sub collection of, of them is independent. Let's see an example. How can a computer choose a random subset? Most computers are able to generate the value of or simulate it. 
a uniform from zero to one random variable that means of a built-in subroutine that to a high degree of approximation produces such random numbers. As a result, it is quite easy for a computer to simulate an indicator, which is a ban uh, binomial, bononi, bononi random variable. Suppose I is an indi indicator variable such that probability of I equals one equals the probability equals the one minus the probability of I equals zero. The computer can simulate I by choosing a uniform uh, from zero to one random number U and then letting I to be one if U less than P probability P zero if it's greater than or equal to that. Suppose we're interested in having the computer select K less than or equal to some N of the numbers in such a way that it choose of that other than choose K subset of such K is equally likely to be chosen. We now present a method that will enable the computer to solve this task. To generate such a subset, we will first simulate in sequence n indicator variables, i1 after in, of which exactly k will equal to one. Those i for which i i equals one will then constitute the desired subset. To generate a random variable i1 after n i n, start by simulating an independent uniform random variable from zero to one. Now define I R I one equals one if U one is less than K over N. And then once I one up to I I are determined recursively, so we can define I I plus one equals one if this in words at the I plus one stage the set equals to one. divided by remaining number of uh, possibilities. Hence, the joint distribution would be just I, I, I1 equals one to the K over N, and for I N plus one equals one with this condition, be this one. Mm, okay, this goes on too much now. So if I, I equals one, If I, I now you could want, okay, I lost my interest in this. Let's see this example. Let X, Y, Z be independent and uniformly distributed in the interval of zero to one. Compute P of X greater than or equal to Y, Z. This is a good example. Since they're independent, we have this, right? And in the interval zero to one, so we have this. Now we have, we want to find the probability of X greater than or equal to Y, Z. So that's in the triple integration because we have three variables, right? Triple integrate the density function over this region. What is this region? So we fix two of them, right? So Y, Z <clears throat> goes from zero to one, zero to one. And then X is greater than Y, Z. So X is greater than YZ, so we start from YZ, then end up at one, the upper, the upper, the upper bound. So we just integrate this. We integrate this, we integrate this, we integrate this, we get three over four. This is a beautiful example. Huh? This is a nice example. Anyone has any questions? All right. Half life. Okay, I don't like the example. I'm gonna skip it. <clears throat> this looks too long also. Let's see this one. <clears throat> Oh, this is following something else.
Okay, that's it. That's it for this chapter. Don't worry about the, the, the other examples. Just focus on the four examples, the beautiful ex four examples. Choose your homework. All right. Okay. Um, for those of you, you know, haven't done much of your presentation, we still have, let me see how many classes we have. <clears throat> we have next week, Tuesday, Thursday, then the following week, we have six classes, all right? 25, 27, May 2nd, May 4th, May 9th, May 11th. Uh, last, so we have six more classes. So make sure you present each class, all right? You see, presentation is not difficult at all. And you have time to, to, to prepare, right? And also your homework, right? Late homework, I do accept the late homework. You don't get 100% for grades anymore, but you still get grades. All right, so we have six more classes to go. All right, anyone has any questions? Um, professor, I got a question about the um, presentation grades. Yes. I think um, you didn't like- I missed it. You didn't yeah. give me credits for the, uh, the ones that stack before spring break and yeah. the one on Tuesday. Yes, I owe some of you. I don't. I just don't remember. I think that one time I just wrote down your name on the side. I intended to, you know, give you a grade later. For, somehow I forgot. So Xiu Yu mentioned it to me. I did add it to hers. Let me add to you and someone else. You may claim your presentation and credit one sixty. Let me see how many of you. I just forgot to do it. Uh, Let's see, so I owe J, right? And uh, who else? Show, right, show you, I give to you already. How I just give to you already. J, anybody else remember I owe you? J, J is here. Wow, J is going to 100, 200 now. So you're definitely going to get an A for this course. You see, this is an easy course, right? All right, Catherine, did I owe you too? Chapter six done? No, chapter six is not done yet. Chapter six is not done yet, right? Let me see. Let's go back to the beginning. Chapter six. Is it done? Let's see. Uh, maybe you're right. Maybe you're, oh no, hold on. Let's go to the syllabus. Yeah, probably I have to do a little bit faster because I have to cover the syllabus. Maybe you're right. Let's check the syllabus all together. Join distribution, independent random variables, sum of independent random variables, functions of random variables, change of variable formula. Let me see. I don't see change of variable formula here. Oh, yes. Exchange of random variables 6.8. So we're going to, let me show you. So since we have, since we have, let me go back to, uh, Sum of independent random variables. <clears throat> Six point three sums of independent random variables. Um, identical distributed uniform uh, gamma random variable, normal random variable. 
Then, so six points, we're going to talk about six points in next class. Then we're going to talk about 6.8, exchanging random variables. Then what else? I don't think uh, I don't think chapter seven is on the list. Yeah, then we go to limit theorem. Chapter oh no, chapter seven we do. Chapter seven we need to talk about joint distributions, joint distributions, some independent. Let's see. Joint distributions. Expectation of sum of random variables, moments of number of events, covariance, conditional and incomplete, condition expectation, joint momentum generating functions. Okay, I think we can skip seven. We skip chapter seven. I don't think chapter seven we have some. Um, so the last last material will be uh, limit theorem. We'll see. Also to see, you know, you have time. Limit theorem. Limit theorem is so important. A central limit theorem is important. Okay, we can talk about this. If you guys feel too tired, uh, uh, yeah, actually we did a lot for this class, and this is only 300 level, but you guys can do it. That's how amazing you are. But if you are too tired, uh, let me know. All right. All right. That's it for today, and let me stop recording.